right, so welcome to the pulse tent. So I'm going to uh, start by talking about some of the pulse crop diseases and then I will turn it over to Partiba for, um, the, uh, um, uh, yeah, and Partiba will talk briefly about International Year of the Pulses and, and why we should all grow pulses and eat pulses. So how many of you here grow pulses? One person? Okay, and I guess that means, do you grow dry beans or do you grow peas or? Peas, Okay. A lot of the pulses, but not dry beans. We haven't had a lot of dry bean growers in the crowd. Yeah, so I will start by talking about uh, some of the, disease, uh, the diseases that I research. I'm at the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Research Centre here in Lethbridge, which is just about five minutes, not even five minutes down the road. Um, so one of the main diseases that I work with is uh, root rot of pulse crops, particularly peas and a little bit of lentils. So I'll start with talking about some of the uh, symptoms that we see on root rots and then we'll end off with some of the foliar diseases um, which haven't been too prevalent this year so it's not that exciting but um, uh, we'll still talk about those a little bit. So when I started here in 2011, I think one of the big questions that I was hearing from producers is what's happening to my pea plants. Right around this time of year you'd often see you get yellowing patches in your in your pea fields. Sometimes you see small yellow patches, other times you'd see these yellow patches that have really expanded across the field. So we wanted to figure out what was going on uh, with these pea crops, uh, how prevalent were these root rots across the province, and really what was causing them. So we started out by doing surveys, taking plants back to the lab. So we go out to the field, we dig them up, we usually chop them off because we don't care about the shoots, we only care about the roots, bring them back to the lab, wash them, rate them, take a look at the symptoms, and then chop up the roots into little pieces, and then we plate them onto an uh, agar media so we can get uh, the fungi, different fungi to grow out of it. So uh, one of the main symptoms that we were seeing at first uh, was very indicative of fusarium root rot. So what you see uh, when you look at the roots is uh, you start seeing blackening at the point of seed attachment, and then that spreads along the tap root um, and sometimes you'll see that the whole tap root has turned black. Sometimes you'll see just kind of in, in early stages like this one, you'll see just a small portion of that tap root that's turned black. Um, and then oftentimes, but not this time, uh, if you cut open the roots uh, kind of in a longitudinal section right where you see the blackening, you'll see bright red vascular tissue. And that's a really, really good clue that it's fusarium root rot. But you don't always see it, so if you don't see it, it doesn't mean that it's not fusarium. Um, so I can pass these around so everyone can have a closer look. Um, and just the other thing to notice too, when we're dealing with fusarium root rot, uh, for the most part what we've seen that the plants can still stay fairly healthy. So these are really nice healthy pea plants, uh, kind of waist high, can get really difficult to uh, walk through fields when they look like this. Um, but you know, you can sustain some of that root rot down here and still get a pretty good yield up in the shoots. And then the other thing to notice is that what's happening in the shoots doesn't always tell you what's happening in the roots. So you might just drive by your pea field and say like, oh, it's really nice and green and healthy, but you really have to dig up the roots um, to see what they look like. And sometimes we can see that the roots are completely black and you still have a really nice healthy shoot. So it's kind of a plug to make sure that, you know, when you're doing your scouting and surveying, dig up the plants and see what those roots look like. So here I can pass this around. Um, yeah, so when we thought that we were primarily dealing with Fusarium root rot, um, you know, our suspicions were confirmed when we did the plating in the lab. Because Fusarium is very, very distinctive on uh, agar media plates. It usually makes this really pretty kind of bright pink, magenta color. Uh, different species will look different, but it's pretty easy to just look at a plate and say, yeah, that's a Fusarium. And so what we were finding is that for uh, the Fusarium species that we were finding on peas is primary, primar primarily this one. Um, it makes kind of a pink, yellow, and white uh, culture, uh, and this is Fusarium avanaceum. We, can f we sometimes find other Fusarium species, but they're not as much of a problem on peas. It's really the avanaceum that seems to like um, and be the most virulent on peas. Um, so it turns out that Fusarium, though, was not kind of the only issue that we were dealing with. Down here in the drier area, in the brown soil zone, we primarily find Fusarium root rot. But when we start looking farther afield um, into the dark brown and black soil zones, we were seeing symptoms that were quite different than Fusarium root rot. Um, so what it was is uh, this disease, which is called a Phantomyces 
root rot. And so you can see the difference, first of all, just in the health of the plant and the health of the shoot, whereas these are much more stunted. You can see that you started to see yellowing of the shoot. Um, and when we first looked at these kind of earlier in June, it was you know, quite evident that there was something going on with these plants. So when you dig up the roots, you can see the difference in the root symptoms. And what we usually see with the Phanomyces is that you get an overall honey brown discoloration of the roots. Um, it usually starts again kind of at that point of seed attachment, um, but you'll see it move up through the epicaudal right up into that the first node and then it abruptly stops at the green stem. Um, and it really girdles the root, so you get kind of a shrinking of that the epicaudal region. Uh, early symptoms, it's very obvious that honey brown color is very, very distinct, but as the disease progresses, other pathogens move in so you can get a lot of fusarium. And so the roots will start to look like this, where they're just kind of a general brown and it be become really hard to actually um, figure out what the symptomology is. So I'll pass these around too so everyone can have a look at those. I'm just going to mention uh, the shuttle's running in at three, which is in about like five minutes. Seven minutes. Yeah. Okay, I'll be fast. No, 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 it it'll go again later. Oh, it's just okay. if you want to go in now, it's going to run. Okay. So, so yeah, so we'll pass these around so we can have a look. Um, and then again, we can see that even with that amount of damage on the roots, uh, there's still, um, you still get some yield out of those, out of those plants. There's still it's some... a little stunted because of that. Yes, yeah. So it is the, the root rot that, that stunted it. And a Phanomyces, um, is a pathogen that really likes wet conditions. So what we found, um, particularly down in this area, we had early seeding of pulse crops. People got them in early April. Then we got rain, some rains in May, and it was just enough moisture in that soil to allow phantomyces to infect. Yeah, typically didn't have to be that wet for that long. Did it, did it? No, no. Um, and then like these plants survived better than I thought they would because we then had a dry June. So. Uh, it allowed kind of the disease to stop and we, we see that there was some regrowth of, of roots so the lateral roots and those plants um, but yes uh, so when we looked at uh, across the, the years and across the province we found a lot of aphanomyces root rot in 2014 very very wet year very little last year in 2015 which was a dry year and then this year in 2016 we've really found that it's been uh, very patchy because our moisture levels have been really patchy across the province so down kind of in the foremost area where they've had maybe a lot more rain than we've had here in the Lethbridge area we've, we've seen a lot more phantomyces root rot there than we would have expected and even here around Lethbridge we're kind of seeing patches of it and then if we move up to the dark brown on the black so soil zones where they typically get more moisture as well we can see that the phantomyces is more of a problem up there as well. Uh, yes, it can be. So peas that are grown under irrigation, it, it can cause more of an issue. And what that the uh, pathogen looks like in culture, was well, just kind of really boring. Nothing flashy about this one. Uh, and so when we were trying to figure out what was going on with our peas and we were culturing everything, and you're picking up these nice, you know, beautiful hot pink cultures, it's really easy to overlook uh, these, these kind of white ones and then when you get to the stage like that where there's a lot of different things going on in the pea plant you can see how it's really easy to miss culturing out of phanomyces. So really how we detected it was uh, using a DNA test or a PCR test to be able to confirm that we were finding a phanomyces in, um, in these plants. Um, and then what we recommend now is that you can send your, um, if you want confirmation or you're uh, that you have a phanomyces if you have suspected in your fields, uh, you can send your uh, tissue samples or even soil samples to some of the seed testing labs and they can do the diagnostics for you to confirm uh, whether it's a phanomyces or not. Okay, um, and it can also infect lentils. Now, these lentils have been chopped off. They're not this not this puny. Uh, like I said, normally when we're doing our surveys, we're not interested in the shoots. We just chop them off and bring this little bit back. But um, so these are not sad looking lentils. But so if you look at the root systems here too, you can see that Aphanomyces affects lentils. Um, and here there's actually better um, symptoms of that honey brown discoloration um, that you often see with this. Okay, so does anyone have any questions on the root rots? So I'll talk uh, very briefly about some foliar diseases. Got too many samples here. I have to find 
So one of the uh, major foliar diseases of pea is um, Mycosphorella or Ascochyta blight. There, it's two different names of the disease for the same disease, basically. And what you see is uh, little purplish spots that start uh, the lower canopy, and then they start moving up uh, under high humidity. And virtually any pea field that you go into, you can probably find a little bit of Mycosphorella. Though having said that, this year we went, I went searching for some good Mycosphorella to, sh to show here, and we really couldn't find that much because it's been pretty dry. But if, if we start getting some more uh, rainy weather coming in now, we'll start to see it uh, move, move uh, across pretty quickly. So what happens is it, it starts on the canopy, or it starts at the bottom of the canopy, you start getting it on the stems. Once it affects that stems, these plants are much more susceptible to lodging. They lodge, they fall over, it becomes much harder to harvest. Um, and so the disease always starts at the bottom and spreads up uh, towards the top of the plant. Um, I can pass these around again so people can look. Again, not, this is a very, very light microspherola infection. Usually we see it at much higher levels than this. Um, yeah, so I guess one of the big questions um, that we get a lot is spraying your uh, pea plant for microspherola blight. Do you usually spray for? Yeah, I typically don't grow peas with them. Well, just no. part of my program. Yeah. I find other benefits to it as well. Yeah. Expandability or something. Yeah, and I think that's what we hear a lot, is that there can be benefits from spraying a fungicide on, on uh, just increasing standability. And so uh, it's yeah, a decision you have to make just based on like fungicide spray, spray decisions. And I have printed out some decision support systems from the Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, if anyone is interested in that. Um, and it just goes through what some of those risk factors are for developing Microsterella. Uh, but it basically looks at the density of your crop canopy, the higher density of your crop canopy, the higher risk factor, um, what the leaf wetness or humidity is um, at noon. I think in the past few days when we were looking for Microsterella blight, we were walking through pea fields in the morning and it was, yeah, you can, you can start getting a lot, of, a lot of dew and humidity in the morning. Uh, the five-day weather forecast, is it going to be dry, is it going to be uh, sort of rainy, really high humidity weather? And then lastly, are you actually finding anything on your plants? And so all those things kind of help guide the decision of whether you should spray. Um, and then the issue with spraying is that the, the crop canopy can get so thick if you wait to spray that you're not going to get any penetration down into the bottom of the canopy where microsterella always starts. So if you're going to go on with a fungicide spray, it should be kind of early flowering to be able to get to that to the point of the plant. Okay, and then the last thing that I want to talk about, um, it's not very exciting, is chocolate spot on fava bean. Um, and none of you guys are fava bean growers down here. Chocolate spot. Like it's, I think you get similar symptoms, but not caused by a different pathogen. Yeah. yeah. Um, so chocolate spot on fava beans. Fava beans are kind of a new crop for Alberta and Saskatchewan. There's a lot of excitement around them. Um, and we chocolate spot can be the main disease issue on that plant on that crop. We haven't seen a lot of it down here in southern Alberta again because it's pretty dry. We have a disease nursery where we're trying to encourage chocolate spots so we can look at fungicide applications. And even with irrigation, we're really not getting a lot of chocolate spot. So this is a disease that is really highly dependent on high humidity. So my son is his favorite disease. So he did a grade five, his grade five science fair project was on <laughs> chocolate spot of fava beans. Is it tasty? And I think, his, <laughs> I think the results are that no, it is not tasty. But, uh, yeah. So we took some, because I couldn't find any disease, I just I had taken some pictures when he was doing his project. So I've just brought those along. Um, and so here we can see a picture of the spores. It's caused by uh, Botrytis species. It produces all these tiny little spores that get blown around in the air. They land on the plant. High humidity conditions, you get infection. Uh, early infection, uh, this is why the disease is called chocolate spot. Early in uh, infection is kind of these little red speckles on the leaves and it really looks like someone kind of dipped a paintbrush in chocolate and just like scattered it all over the plant. So. Uh, this is called the non-aggressive phase of the disease and then if you get really high humidity conditions uh, you know about probably above 80 percent for five days or so which never happens down here um, then the disease can start spreading quite rapidly and moves into this aggressive 
space. And so you can see some pictures here where you go from these little red speckles to these quite large spreading gray lesions. Under really high humidity, they'll start sporulating, make more canidia, and then they can rapidly spread throughout the plant. So we're currently um, involved in a couple of research projects that are looking at fungicide application timing and which fungicides are, would be effective against this disease. So I will pass those along too and take those back. And did I have anything else to say, Partiva? No. I think that was all I had to say. And I will turn it over to Partiva now. Oh, right, and the snacks. So yes, please help yourself. Um, I love researching pulse diseases, but I love cooking with pulses even more and trying to get my kids to eat pulses. So I made some flourless black bean brownies. No offense to anyone that doesn't like flour that grows wheat, but yeah, these are really good. Uh, and then we have some buns where I just took out a cup of flour and added in a cup of pureed split peas, some chickpea cookies, and some lentil chocolate chip cookies. So please help yourself enjoy eating pulses. Uh, my name is Partiva Balasubramanian. I'm a dry bean breeder here. Just wanted to confirm, are there any dry bean growers? Uh, okay, so I'll try and keep my talk as general as possible and try to focus more on the International Year of the Pulses. Um, the FAO has declared 2016 as the International Year of the Pulses. Uh, myself and Sharma on June 23rd, we gave a, a general uh, presentation at the, at the main public library here in Lethbridge. So I just printed some slides, so just to share with you. Uh, this is the logo that the FAO uh, came up with uh, for the International Year of the Pulses. Uh, 2008 was the International Year of Potato, 2013 was the International Year of Quinoa, and 2016 is the International Year of Pulses. And they do that to promote the awareness of pulse crop uh, across the world and um, especially the nutritional aspect of the pulse crop um, uh, that's more from food security standpoint and also for a sustainable production standpoint um, if you take a closer look at this logo you'll find uh, there's a, a dark red kidney all the pulse crops are presented here there's a dark red kidney white kidney there's yellow and green pea there's lentils and also there's chickpea here as well and it is shaped most importantly it's shaped in the form of a heart and that's to convey the message that consumption of pulses is good for your health and we know uh, pulses have low fat content they have high protein content compared to cereals and they also fix nitrogen dr newton newbury is the soil microbiologist Biologist here in AFC Lethbridge. He has done excellent work, especially in pea, to show that uh, uh, peas are one of the best nitrogen fixers of all pulse crops that are currently grown in Canada and also the nitrogen benefit is of nitrogen is available to the crop that follows the pea and also it's available for two or three years beyond the first crop that immediately follows the pea crop as well so they offer nitrogen benefits and uh, as I mentioned earlier consumption of pulses in general is good for human health and I think Shama has done her part in including uh, various pulse crops in the snacks that she has baked for us um, uh, this slide shows the various pulse crops that are grown in Canada. Almost all of the pulse crops, pea, lentil, dry bean, chickpea and fava bean are grown in Alberta. The only pulse crop that's not grown here in this province is the mung bean. Uh, we need a little bit more heat units, so it's grown primarily in Ontario. The mung bean is commercially grown uh, in, in Ontario. And there are, of course, pulse grower organizations across this country, the Ontario bean growers, Manitoba pulse and soybean growers, uh, the Saskatchewan pulse growers and the Alberta Pulse Growers Commission were actively involved in uh, supporting pulse research and also pulse production and uh, I would encourage you to visit their websites because you would get a lot more recipes on how you could include pulses in in your everyday diet so in addition to all the other information that they have so and uh, this uh, slide uh, is from Agriculture and Food Canada website and it is current as of 2014. They are still working on the 2015 data and it, it shows that for the three prairie provinces, the export value of the pulse crop in 2014 was close to $2 billion and it's, it's, in, and it's next only to canola and wheat. So that's how important the pulse crops are to the prairie agriculture. And I'm, if you wait another three or four months, I'm sure they would include the 2015 uh, crop year as well, the data for the 2015 crop here as well. 
and uh, the lastly this again is from the AFC website as well much of the pulse crop that's produced in Canada is exported to um, uh, to Asia uh, to China the Indian subcontinent and also to Middle East and of course there are some beans that are exported to Central and South American countries and to Europe so but the majority vast, vast majority of the pulse crop in general is exported to Asia and so all of this information is available in the AFC website uh, I'm a, a dry bean breeder so I work primarily with uh, with dry bean and our objective uh, here in our program is to develop new cultivars for production under irrigation in uh, in Alberta and in Saskatchewan um, our, very briefly our objectives are to select for early maturity with high yield because Saskatchewan and Alberta have one of the shortest growing season on the prairie so our objective is to combine high yield with early maturity select for lodging resistance because we know plants that are upright at flowering and maturity are able to withstand white mold a lot better than the plants that fall over at maturity so and lastly 98% of dry bean that is uh, grown is used for food and so seed quality is extremely important it's only the split and broken beans that end up as feed so mostly uh, most of the production of dry bean is for food use so seed quality is extremely important I have um, a dry bean uh, culti the seed samples of dry bean cultivars here um, this is this is a, this is a this is a pinto bean. This is the largest market class that's grown in Alberta. So we have been able to develop a pinto bean with a brighter seed coat color because um, all of these seed samples were harvested at the same time. That's last year, and you could see see that some of these newer varieties have a brighter seed coat color compared to the varieties that are currently grown. So the the brighter color. Uh, seeds are preferred by consumers so that that's why we wanted to develop them and it also means a premium to the bean growers as well and uh, the next market class is great northern this is the second largest market class grown in alberta and uh, this is ac resolute was registered in 2004 and the thousand seed weight here is 340 grams and this is ac white star this we just registered it uh, two months ago and uh, the thousand seed weight is close to 400 grams so uh, in the mediterranean region they prefer larger seed size so again a larger seed size means it's premium for the bean growers here so and Do you want uh, to pass those around oh yes uh, of course They're not sealed, folks. So. Yeah, the and this is uh, AAC Explorer was also registered just May of this year, so I'll just pass these two sure. for comparison. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sure you got them. Yeah. Uh, yellow bean is the other market class uh, that's grown in Alberta, and uh, Mayasi is the type that's currently grown right now, and it has a lighter yellow color. And we we registered two lines. Again, in May of this year, uh, AAC Y012 and Y015, they have a much nicer yellow color. Again, uh, nicer color, large seed size means that again, it's premium for the bean growers. So I'll just pass on just these yeah. three. Just these three. And lastly, there's currently black bean and red beans are also grown. Um, AAC Black Diamond 2 has resistance to bacterial blight. So that's the primary reason why this line was registered. Uh, AC Red Bond was registered, I believe, in 1999. So it's, it's an old variety, but it's still commercially grown uh, in this province. I'll pass these two. And uh, I'll finish with uh, just one last slide, which is the diseases. Uh, common bacterial blight and white mold are the two major diseases that we have in dry bean. Uh, this is uh, common, the symptoms of common bacterial blight and we work very closely with uh, Dr. Shama Chatterton and our research team in terms of incorporating uh, disease resistance uh, for these two diseases. So, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So if, I have, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.